I wouldn't say. So. so we spoke about how we got to make every moment count. And that's kind of what we're doing every day with the Sphere of Omer. We're counting. Counting, counting, counting. I saw a meme earlier this week. You know, um, what does God ask of you? Just count to 49. And then in response, it says, Jews. Oops, I forgot a night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How hard is it to count to 49? Well, you know, sometimes if you don't have a minion that you're going to every night, it could uh, could be very hard. I have an app that reminds me, and it, and it dings every night. Remember to count the Omer. And, and then if you forget to count at night, it dings you again in the morning. You know, make sure to, to make up the count that you missed last night. And as long as you keep going the next day, you can keep the count going. Uh, but Spirit of Oymer teaches us to make every moment count. Every day is a whole it's a whole world. We count it. We're counting to something precious, counting to receiving the Torah. But each day counts up. It's not 49 days left, 48 days left, 47 days left. We start with today is one day of the Omer. Today is two days of the Omer. We're counting up. We're building the growth and the momentum every single day until we reach 49 is the epitome of perfection, of, of how far a human being can reach. Seven times seven, all seven emotions with all of their seven details, each one. And then the 50th, the giving of the Torah, the next day is sort of like the infinity beyond. And so it's apropos that we start the book of Numbers, as it's a lot of times called, Sefer Bamidbar, or otherwise known as Sefer HaPikudim, the book of censuses, counting. Before we receive the Torah, Mount Sinai. So this, this week's Torah portion is actually my Bar Mitzvah Parsha, the first Parsha that I got to uh, go up in front of the whole congregation and read. And so uh, so it should be uh, still pretty sharp. Let's <laughs> give it a go. <laughs> you know this one. Vaidaber Adonai Yal Moshe Bimibar Sinai Bar Moye Bechad Lachaide Shashani Bachana Hashani Let's say some may add us Mitzrayim Lemor. It was on the first day of the second month, in the second year following the exodus of Egypt, that Hashem spoke to Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai and said, Count the heads or lift up the heads of the entire congregation of Israel according to their families and to the house of their fathers in the listing the names of every male head by head. Rashi points out in the very first uh, Pasuk, by the bear, by Midbar Sinai, mitoich chibasan, because of how precious the Jewish people are to Hashem, lefanav, mayna aysam kol sha'a, God is always counting them, all the time. Kish yatsumi mitzrayim, manam. When they left Egypt, he counted them. Lukshanafu be'egol, manam le'edem midnight in the sodim. When they fell with the golden calf, he counted to know how many are left. And when it came time for the Divine Presence to rest upon them, he counts them again. It was on the first day of the month of Nisan that the tabernacle was erected. One month later, on the first day of Iyar, God counts them. It's like a gem. If you have a gem collection... If it's something really important to you, then you're always counting them. You want to know how many you have, make sure they're all there. It's because each individual piece is precious. But when God's counting or asking the J Moshe and Aharon to count, he already knows how many Jews there are. So why does he have Moshe count them? 
Tell him. <laughs> so he gets it. He did better than David. David uh -huh. went, went ahead and wanted to count him on his own, and he got in trouble. So Moshe would know. Could be. But Rashi says it's because of how precious it is to God. How precious the Jewish people are. And he says he counts them all the time. But also, counting them all the time, really? I mean, three times out of 40 years might be a lot of censuses. How often did they do a census in America? I think they do it uh, once every 10 years. Yeah, I think every 10 years. Every 10 years is another census. Here, you have uh, three censuses. Uh, some of them were very close together, only a couple years apart, uh, or less than a year apart. But then you go 38 years of wandering in the desert before you get another counting near the very end. And then our sages say that there were nine times in total that the Jewish people were counted as a whole. And the tenth time will be when Mashiach comes. So that doesn't sound like all the time. What does what does it mean? He counts them all the time. And also, if he's counting them because of the tabernacle functioning, then why not count them on the first of Nisan when they set up the tabernacle and it started functioning? Or maybe the next day, if you know things are too busy on the inauguration day. But why wait until a month later, the month of ER, and then start counting them? And our third question is, why was it specifically this counting, unlike the other countings, that Moshe and Aharon are told them are, are told to count the Jewish people together? Before Hashem just told Moshe, you do it. Now he's speaking to Moshe and Aaron. So to explain this, we have to get into the inner dimension of what counting is really all about. So we'll learn this, this sikha together. Is there a beer b'cholza, to explain these concepts in a deeper inner dimension? The concept of counting is that no matter how big or small a person is, every person gets counted as one. And so what are you counting when you're doing a census? It's not their bank accounts because then everybody's different. It's not their qualities because different people have different strengths and weaknesses. Rather, you're counting something in which we are all the same, namely our fundamental Jewish core that is shared by everybody equally. Now, this fundamental Jewish core is so holy and lofty, it's beyond revelation. Therefore, Hashem needs us to count them in order to bring out and reveal like uh, like you said so that so that uh, Moshe would know so that the world would know so it's it's shown and revealed to like Rashi says to display how precious they are to make it shown and revealed this sort of quintessential property in which we are all equal we're all the same this intrinsic virtue needs to uh, be manifest, and the counting brings that out. So Now we can understand what Rashi says when he means that he counts them all the time. What do you mean all the time? You know, yeah, he counted them right when they left Egypt and then the next year, but then you have long periods of time where... You, uh, where, where you don't have anybody counting them. Counting brings out something intrinsic about the Jewish people. And when Rashi says, kol sha'ah, what it means is that whenever there is a significant change that the Jewish people go through, this is kind of brought out again. And it's something that is, um, 
it's like we have in the halacha, there's a, something called a pu'ula nimshech, something that is constantly ongoing. It didn't just happen once, but it is an ongoing process. Like some people view the exodus from Egypt as a one-time event that happened a long time ago, but there's other ways of looking at it like it's a pu'ula nimshech, it's an ongoing process that's that we are in the process of that is happening currently. So similarly, the counting of the Jewish people is something that impacts and reveals something about the Jewish people at every moment or all the time. And this also explains why Yidid are ready to give up their whole lives for Hashem. You know, it might it might make more sense, you know, over a long period of time, somebody's pointing a gun at your head and saying, worship idols. Well, you'll just give in for a moment and then go back to your Jewish life. But Bekol Sha'ah, this idea that we cannot, God forbid, be disconnected from Hashem for even one moment is something that is something that makes it so that we don't just say, you know what, I'll do I'll do teshuva later. Or I'll just give in to this temptation and then later when I do teshuva, I'll make it up. You know, teshuva really does transform our negative past into uh, into merits and good things. But this idea that, uh, that we bring out our inner core, the chol sha'ad all times means that... That we can't um that we can't even momentarily do an act that puts us in in a space of separation. And there are yidden throughout Jewish history that were willing to give up their life rather than to be <coughs> separated, even on a temporary basis. And this is the divine light that's enclosed in our neshama that rules over it and is always present. And and so even if it's that it doesn't make a difference to this when when this core is revealed it doesn't make a difference if it's just a moment or a whole lifetime of separation because in that essential regard of it being cut off it's uh, it's unthinkable. So that's what Rashi means when he says that he counts them all the time. Now, we could also put into context the three times that God counted the Jewish people. One, when they first left Egypt. The second time was after the sin of the golden calf, right before they erected the Mishkan. And the second, and the third time was an ER, a month after the Mishkan was put up. Because there's three ways that the Nekudas HaYahadus, this Jewish core, is manifest within the Jewish people. On a basic level, even after a person's Jewish core is revealed, to the point that they're even ready to be Meister Nefesh, give over their very lives for Hashem, it doesn't necessarily transform their mind and heart or change them into a, a whole new person. That's why you had some really devoted Hasidim in the old country in Russia that when push came to shove, were ready to give up their whole life for Hashem. And then in America, it wasn't so recognizable that same level of commitment and devotion when the challenge went away. Then there's a deeper level. That's the arousal of a person's Jewish core that also affects their conscious power, which means that our minds start to appreciate and become committed to the values that reflect our inner core. Nevertheless, it'll also be perceptible that it's not who he is. It, it's like there's two separate things. You have my deep spiritual core, and then my intellectual understanding, as if they are uh, two separate parts of me. And then there's the third aspect, where the nukudas hayahadus nem sein ganz where the Jewish entity of your, your divine spark, your core permeates your entire being, 
becoming the totality of your entire existence. And so then as a natural consequence of that, your mind understands and dictates that his entire being should become aligned with that inner core and actually act according to it. And these three ways in which the soul is counted and brought out and revealed correlate to the three times that the Jewish people were counted. When God took us out of Egypt, it was God schlepping us out. We weren't really ready for it, but God revealed our divine soul and said, you're coming along, even if your body or other aspects of your physical being are not really up to that point yet. Then the second one was, make me a sanctuary and I will dwell within them, which is already God saying, I want to make you into my home. It's just a revelation from above where God is uh, asking of us to not just be schlepped out of Mitzrayim, but to, um, but to start transforming our inner self. And then the third one is after the Mishkan is already put up and functioning and going, then through our involvement in carrying out the service in the Mishkan, it brings out this third uh, consensus, this third uh, so this third census, this third uh, counting or bringing out the endearment, the how precious the Jewish people are, that every aspect of them is now permeated with that divine core through and through. So this is actually the, the big difference between the two months of Nisan and Iyar. Nisan is the month of miracles where God took us out of Mitzrayim, and it's all about the revelation from above. Where Er, on the other hand, is all about our effort to refine ourselves. Every single day is a mitzvah, counting the Omer, and spiritualizing ourselves. And so it makes sense that the third counting would be in which month? In Er, and the one that expresses our, our yearning, to transform ourselves from below to above and becoming fully in sync with that divine core. And all of this is a preparation for the giving of the Torah. Because what happened when God gave us the Torah? It wasn't just that we received a new piece of wisdom, but there was a decree between heavens and earth. It says, Hashem, Adam. The heavens are the heavens of God, and the earth I gave to mankind. And it was kind of like a border that uh, was impassable. The Medrash gives a parable of this between Romia and Surya, between Rome and Syria. There was two empires, and they made a border and they said that the Syrians can't go to Rome and the Rome, Romans can't go to, to, uh, to Syria. And then one of the kings came and, uh, and said, we're going to break the decree and, uh, and allow passage back and forth. Similarly, on Mount Sinai, God says that I'm nullifying the decree and I will begin. I will traverse this boundary between heaven and earth and God came down on Mount Sinai and Moshe went up to heaven and that opened up the channel for the spiritual energy to manifest in the material and for the material to be able to elevate all the way up to the spiritual. And these two concepts are related to the different types of counting. One type of counting, the initial type of counting, is really more of a divine revelation from above, bringing out, I love you so much, I'm counting you all the time, you're so precious to me. But then this third counting, which is the one that we read always, right before the giving of the Torah, is the one that brings out our effort in ascending the mountain, so to speak, of... Uh, of coming up and becoming in sync with 
that revelation of our divine core. So the, the Gemara in Shabbos 88b has a fascinating discussion about what happened when Moshe went up to the mountain, that with this understanding of how uh, the uh, the purpose of Matan Torah was to fuse together heaven and earth, we can understand this challenge that Moshe received by the angels on Mount Sinai and his answer that he gave. Uh, we'll learn this uh, piece of Talmud together. V'yama Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi says, B'shosh ala Ma'isha l'mari, Amar Malchia Shara Slechnei HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when Ma'isha went up to the mountain, the angel said before God, Rebbeinu Shalayla, Master of the World, Mali Yulad Isha Beinayna, what is this woman born doing amongst us? Why is there a human being here? Amar Lahem, he said to them, L'kabal Torah Ba, Hashem said he came to receive the Torah. Amar Lafanav, the angel said before him, He said, you have this hidden treasure concealed to you from 974 generations before the creation of the world. And now you just want to give it to flesh and blood? What is man? Like, uh, like it says in Tehillim, um, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you should think of him? Rather, to know, they said, cast your glory upon the heavens. So Amr, God said to Moses, you answer them. Amr, the fun of... He says, I'm afraid, maybe they're going to burn me with a fire from their mouths. I mean, talking to angels, right? He says, grab onto my throne of glory and give him an answer. So anyways, Amar Lafanov, what did Maisha say? Maisha responded, master of the world. The Torah that you're giving to me. What does it say inside? I am Hashem, your God, who took you out of Egypt. So Moshe turned to them and said, Hey, you guys, angels, did you go down to Egypt? I don't think so. He stopped them. Were you enslaved to Padoi? So why should you get the Torah? What else does it say in the Torah? Don't have any other gods. Do you live um, amongst other nations that worship idols? But what else does it say in the Torah? It says, remember Shabbos and keep it holy. Do you even do work that you need to rest from? The Torah says, keep Shabbos. You guys don't work. You don't need to rest. Says what else does it say? It says, uh, honor your mother and father. Do you have a mother and father? No. Uh, it says, do not steal. Do not um, commit adultery. Do not um, uh, do not do not um, do not be jealous, right? Mm -hmm. Is there jealousy amongst mm -hmm. them? Do they have a Yetzir Hara at all? So right away, And so right away, Hashem agreed with Moshe. And uh, as it is stated, God our Lord, how glorious is your name in all of the earth. While... That your majesty is placed above the heavens is not written because the angels agreed with Hashem that it's appropriate to give the Torah to the Jewish people. Right away, every single one of the angels were in total awe of Moshe and became a great admirer. And they wanted to give him something. They said, you came up on high and you 
took a captive, you took gifts on account of man. And then in reward to that, each one, all the all the angels wanted to give him something, even the angel of death. He said, um, he told Moshe how to stop the plague. As it says, uh, Moshe put the incense and he atoned for the people and he stood between the dead and the living and the plague stopped. If it were not for the angel of death, would uh, Moshe have known that? <laughs> so... Not only did we get the Torah, but all the angels agreed. They said, you're right. Now, they didn't want the Torah in a physical sense. They wanted the Torah in sort of the spiritual dimension. So what was Moshe really answering them when he said, you know, do you do business dealings? Do you go down to Egypt? They wanted sort of like the, uh, the spiritual precedent. But as we know, God's desire is to have a dwelling place here in this physical world. And this is what makes a person, a human being, so precious to Hashem. And that's what we are counting here. We're counting on every single Yid to not just be a holy Jew in potential and in spirit and in your uh, indomitable uh, soul essence, but to translate that truth of who you are into everything about you. And that's the whole idea of the giving of the Torah down here is both that the heaven that heavens come down to earth, but that earth can be refined and be spiritualized. But it's not through giving the Torah to the angels or us becoming angels. But like Maisha said, the very challenges that we face and the temptations that we have are what enable us to fully bring heaven down to earth and bring that, um, that preciousness of what it is that we were chosen for and counted on uh, to, uh, to, to be manifest. And that's in the Mishnah, that part? That was in uh, Talmud Masech the Shabbos. And then remember the Gemara that we learned uh, from uh, Tractate Menachis on mm -hmm. Daf uh, uh, 29. We were learning on Shabbos another encounter that Moshe had up on the mountain where um, Moshe saw God tying crowns on each letter. And, and Moshe's like, uh, if, if you don't put these crowns on, Who's going to notice? Who's going to even be able to interpret what the meanings of all of these crowns are? And God said, there's going to come a man whose name is Akiva ben Yosef, and he's going to explain the meaning of all of these crowns. And Moshe said, really? Show him to me. He says, turn around. He gets sent eight rows back into the yeshiva, and he sees Rabbi Akiva teaching, explaining all of the uh, the deep meanings and Moshe feels uh, a little bit blown away by how amazing this, this uh, scholar is, but also a little bit weak or despondent. Like, wow. I, until he hears one of the students say, uh, Rabbi, where did you get all this information from? And he says, I learned it as Allah Moshe Misenai. I learned it from Moses on Mount Sinai. And then Moshe, so he got relieved. And came back to Mount Sinai. <laughs> And then, and then Maisha was like, wow, I, I've never met a guy like that. This is somebody who really studies Torah. Show me what kind of reward does a person like this get? I got to see it. And God said, turn around, show you. And he, Maisha goes and sees how the Romans are combing his uh, flesh in a butcher shop. And Maisha turns back to God and says, Zu taira zu taira. This is the taira and this is its reward. And God says, kach ola He says, be quiet. This is my divine intent that arose before me. Almost like, Maisha, I want to understand the reward. And it's like, yeah, this is <laughs> what Rabbi Akiva was yearning for his whole life is to be able to give his life over for Hashem.
I don't know what Moshe was expecting to see. <laughs> I don't know, a big mansion. I don't know. Maybe heavenly connection, lead it, leading the earth into peace. Mm. I mean, Moshe got because to leave. He knew, what else was coming, because he knew what else was coming too. But Moshe got to leave with leave with the with the kiss of Hashem, where uh, it was the most peaceful and and beautiful, uh, tranquil passing. But Rabbi Akiva was in a different era. Was in an era of Gullus, which I mean, uh, God says, "Kach alab You know, this is what I uh, decided. But um, I mean, who are we to really uh, say <laughs> what well, what or why? Yeah. But but there is there is something very profound that we have in our ability to display our full devotion to Hashem without any expectation of reward or salvation. And even now, as we're yearning for Mashiach every single moment, we're not yearning for Mashiach for all this physical delights for our own self, but rather to fulfill the divine will, that God wants to bless us and he wants this world to be a place of abundance and divine blessing and goodness, and therefore gave us the Torah and gave us... Um, all, all of the, the promised blessings that will be when Mashiach comes. What is it with this uh, 900 generations? What is it about 940-something generations? I didn't really look into that. I don't know offhand. <clears throat> uh, because obviously it's before... Um, obviously it's, it's before the the world was created so you know it has to be uh shalom aleichem abba welcome a abba we have a question maybe you know uh it says 941 gener uh, generations before the world was created you had the taira so we're familiar with but in the gemara in shabbos 88b it says that there was 941 do you know the significance of that number no i don't know okay <laughs> no no how's it going where are you joining from Ava? very nice very nice very very nice we we're just finishing up we were, we we're learning a sikha about how hashem okay. counts the yidden at all times to show how precious they are to bring out their preciousness hashem already knows how many yidden there are but in order that we should know or that our preciousness should be uh, shown and revealed here in this world hashem counts us at, at every at every significant um step in the road primarily right when we left egypt which was like a revelation from above then before we built the mishkan and then after the Mikshan was functioning in the month of ER, it's all about our Avaida from um, from below to above and the full synthesis of bringing our, our our whole mind and heart and everything to be in line with that Nekudas HaYahadus, that, that divine core that's revealed through the counting. Was, the count, was there less and less every time they counted? Because it sounds like not everybody would be... There are less and less people in a spiritual state because everybody got out of Egypt, but not everybody got spiritual and not everybody was there for the Mishkan. Well, uh, there were times right after uh, people, uh, after the plague or whatever, that they were counted. But I think most of the times it was going up because they were having lots of children still. Ah, so the children, but <clears throat> kept growing more than they were dying. But we have the exact numbers and in, in this uh, this week's Torah portion, we have the grand total of 603,550. Yeah, that's which is where Which is where we get the general number of 600,000 souls at any time. And then you have to double that because each one is just a half, and then you have the uh, the feminine half, so that's one point two million, and that's only the um, between the age twenty and sixty because they were counting specifically uh, for who can be conscripted into the army, and so to add the children and then the seniors, 
you have millions, millions and millions that stood by Mount Sinai and got the Torah. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to look into that thing with the Dorot. That's interesting. With the 900 something Dorot. It's, it's like yeah. the angels themselves didn't have Torah. Right. So it says, Achem de Genuza, the Torah is a hidden treasure that was concealed by you 974 generations before the creation of the world. That's a lot of years. Yeah. Let's see if um oh so Rashi says nine hundred and seventy four generations in the 2,000 years that the Torah preceded the world, these generations were destined to be created. As it says in Tehillim, the world he commanded for a thousand generations. But the Holy One, blessed be, he saw that the world did not survive so well without Torah, so he passed them up and did not create them. But he gave it to the 26th generation. So behold, that 974 we're missing from the thousand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I get it. Somewhat. <laughs> no, it's a... Uh, it was intended to be thousand generations, but then yeah. it was 36. <laughs> but the seven, 974 got skipped for whatever reason, somewhere. Right. Yeah. The 2,000 years, so it's connected to the idea of 2,000 years. And, and the 2,000 years, uh, Hasidus explains, based on the Kabbalistic concept of aluf chachma, aluf chabina. You have the thousand of chachma and the thousand of bina. And the Torah is the divine wisdom that predates the world by the 1,000 chachma and the 1,000 bina. <clears throat> Yeah, all the little details. So, so in those two thousand years, these generations were destined to be created, but Hashem saw the world couldn't manage without the Taita, so He gave us the Taita. So no, so have a kabbalah the Taita, but simple pinimias should receive the Torah joyously and then a real deep, inner, meaningful, and personal way. So are we going to get Minyan for Shavuot? Bezirat Hashem, that's the plan. Okay. Abi, you want to fly to Humboldt and help us with the Minyan? Sorry. <laughs> Another time. All right, very good. Laila Tov. Laila Tov. Laila Tov. Have a great night. We'll see yeah, you next happy week. Happy birthday, you all. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. Thanks, happy Nick. How's, how's, how's Marie and the kids? How's Marie good, and the good. kids doing? Good, good. Marie is good. busy with the kids.